event. Uh, this is one of our uh, events in our series uh, for the Good Web Network, where we are trying to build towards technologies uh, that promote democratic rights um, and well-being. Uh, and we're really excited to have uh, two speakers with us today to be talking about, is generative AI good for democracy? Uh, which is obviously the question on, on everybody's minds. Uh, so we have Karis Afoko, who's the Senior Director for Communications and External Affairs at Mozilla, and we have Laura Giesen, who's Program Manager at Democracy Technologies. Um, so thank you so much both for joining us today. Um, so obviously, you know, generative AI has been the kind of the topic of the moment, um, particularly since ChatGPT released in November last year. It seems like there have been an endless array of, of think pieces and uh, reports and all sorts about people saying, this is going to save humanity. This is um, going to revolutionize how we do everything. Uh, people saying that this is going to be the death of democracy and it's going to destroy the world. And people saying, oh, this is all a lot of hype. It's just another uh, bit of technology and everyone's worrying about it all too much. Uh, so we're keen to be getting into those discussions and debates this evening. Um, I think one of the kind of key tensions that we've been seeing in, in some of the work uh, we've been doing when we've been looking at how people are talking about generative AI and uh, what it might mean is these sort of conflicts between where we think about the process uh, through which these, uh, these AI models are developed and built and trained, how they're set out in the world, um, how they're monitored, how they're moderated, lots of debate around what the right way to do that is, how open should it be, who should be involved, who's consulted, who should be in the room, um, and then we've got a lot of worry about the outcomes. You know, what happens when this technology is widely used? Uh, is it going to make everything much easier or is it going to just end up with even more information, chaos and disorder uh, than we already have? So I'm going to kick off um, by asking our speakers to give a very quick answer to is generative AI good for democracy? And then we will dive into things in more detail. Please be thinking about questions um, and comments because we're going to have a quite interactive discussion, I hope, this evening. We'll wrap up about seven with sort of the main discussion, but then please do stay afterwards for drinks. Um, quick housekeeping, just to say the fire exit is at the back of the room on the right. Hopefully we will not need to use it. Um, and bathroom is at the back and please have yourself to more drinks uh, at any time. And thank you also to our online participants for joining. I think I'm looking at the right camera. Um, and please do put in any comments in the chat. Uh, we have our wonderful researcher, Sophia, is, is monitoring that as well. Um, so I wonder if, Laura, if I could come to you first for your extremely quick hot take, is generative AI good for democracy? Yeah, I've, I'm afraid that the net uh, effect of AI or of generative AI is negative for democracy because I think um, the applications that are harmful um, to democracy are just way more easy to use and way more scalable than um, those that are beneficial to democracy, which both Great. exist. Thank you. So we have a we have a bad for democracy because it's a lot easier to do bad things with it. Karis, what would be your um, I'm short not going to say it's good for democracy, but I think it's a net neutral. Um, I think that I think if we're thinking about technology and how it harms democracy, I think there's a bigger threat. Do you want me to talk about now? Or? Yes, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands to, to kick things off in a participatory fashion. Um, but on, a, on a binary yes, no, is generative AI good for democracy? Can I get a show of hands for yes? Okay, we've got, we've got two. And then can I get a show of hands for no? There can be no abstentions. <laughs> Amazing. All right. We, we will see if we have changed any of your minds by the end of this evening. Um, so, yeah, Karis, I'd love to love to come back to you to hear more of your thoughts on sure. and Laura, I why think, it's I a didn't net hope neutral. I going to go first, so um, you can contradict <laughs> me and prove me wrong. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Karis Avoko. I work at a company and a nonprofit called Mozilla. Everyone familiar with us? Um, great. We're 25 years old this week. Um, so we've been fighting for a bit better internet for nearly three decades. Um, and I work for the foundation, which owns the technology company that builds a web browser called Firefox and a number of other products. So that's me. One thing about working in technology is it's very similar to the fashion industry. So the generative AI boom is one of the few times I've got to feel really on trend uh, because <laughs> Mozilla's foundation has been focusing on trustworthy AI, how we build it, um, what the barriers are to having it for several years. And I've been working there for a few of those years. I think what I wanted to talk about today, although I'm really interested in hearing from all of you and Laura, is 
just this idea that technology isn't really an inherently good or bad thing. It's a tool that's built by us. And so a lot of the thing, and I think where we are in the trend wave of generative AI is many of you have probably used chat GPT, lots of money has poured into it. Anyone working in a tech company or even a number of other companies has had panic discussions about what we're going to do with AI and how are we using AI. Um, and now we're getting the wave has crested and we're getting a series of stories from concerned journalists about all the terrible uses of the tech. Um, and that isn't particularly new. And I think the main thing I wanted to say to you all is generative AI and AI and machine learning aren't new at all. Who's familiar with DeepMind? Yeah, uh, headquartered, I think at the moment in King's Cross, but companies like Google have been making major investments in artificial intelligence, companies like us, for years and years now. And AI powered products are already in use for most consumers. But there are a few things about generative AI and AI that we need to be concerned about. So there are three things I think we need to worry about, and then there's one thing we need to worry about a lot more, which I'll talk about at the end. So three things we need to worry about with AI. First of all, transparency. Most of the most powerful generative AI or any AI systems we're using have really limited transparency. And ChatGPT, um, owned by OpenAI, is a great example of that. As some of you probably know, OpenAI started out as a non-profit. It's now a for-profit company with uh, millions and millions of dollars of money, mostly from Microsoft pouring into it. And whether we're thinking about ChatGPT, which I'm sure lots of us have played with, or YouTube, a really powerful platform, probably one of the biggest broadcasters in the world with a recommender algorithm that no one really knows how it works and Google don't share any information about. The real issue we're talking about is transparency. So who has watched something that YouTube has recommended to them? Who's been on YouTube and watched something that they didn't plan to watch? Okay, so most of us in the room and most of the content viewed on YouTube is recommended content. So most of the power of the platform is you come on to look at a curly hair tutorial, for example, if you're me, um, and you stay because YouTube knows exactly what you want to see next. In fact, when I applied for my job at Mozilla, YouTube served me the trailer for The Social Dilemma, which was a very good job, so I'm <laughs> grateful to them as well. Um, but the real issue is we don't know, it's a black box. Um, none of us know why the algorithm is so powerful. We know that it is powerful, and increasingly we know it drives things like polarization, which we do need to care about for democracy. Um, and the reason I know a bit about this is one of the things Mozilla Foundation does is try to understand how the algorithm is working. But we're really flying blind here. We've got a browser extension called, the, called Regrets Reporter that about 40,000 people have downloaded. And so we gather data using machine learning and AI powered tools about the recommendations people are getting on YouTube. And if you're interested in the findings, I can talk about them later or you can Google them. But some of the things we found are pretty concerning. So last year, we published a large scale study on YouTube's use of control. So does everyone know what the dislike button is? Our study found that it only works about 43% of the time. So a lot of the controls you're being given for AI powered tools actually don't work. So it's like pushing a lift button and it doesn't do anything, which incidentally a lot of lift buttons also don't work. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing to worry about with generative AI and all AI is transparency because big companies are running these um, large language sets or able algorithms. We don't know how they're working and because they're commercially proprietary information we have very limited ways of scrutinizing. Second thing we need to worry about is data. So most of us have probably done a deal with a, lo a large number of tech companies, which is we'll give you our data, often unknowingly, and you'll give us products and services. So anyone in here use WhatsApp, Instagram, yeah, and I think probably most of you, because you've come to a dance event, know that you know if the if the service is free, you're the product. So generative AI and most AI models are using huge, huge data sets to power them. Um, and the reasons we need to worry about that are, number one, it's not always data they own. Um, and number two, the extraction of that data is coming at a cost to all of us. So the second reason we do need to worry about AI is the scale of data. And I'm going to talk about another Mozilla project, project here. Um, it, uh, which is an example of where it can sometimes be good, is uh, a project called Common Voice. So does anyone have an Alexa or a Google Home? 
any sort of voice activated AI. So it heavily, it heavily biases towards English language and heavily biases towards Americans because most tech, big tech companies are in America. So Common Voice is a huge open source data, um, data set that Mozilla funds and powers with a few other partners that focuses on languages that are underserved. So if you speak Kiswahili or Welsh, a Welsh parent, um, then you can donate your data to that data set and build better voice activated tools. So we do need to worry about data with AI, but also we own our data and we can control where it goes. So the second thing we think about is data. And then the third thing is bias. The person that builds the generative AI tool or the large, the, the large language model builds in whatever bias they have. Um, are people familiar with examples of that? Um, yeah, see a few nods. Um, the bias of Google search algorithm is well known. If you Google, you know, CEO, uh, you're more likely to get a white man, for example, which is about the bias that's been built into the tool. Um, and I think that really connects to where I think the biggest threat to democracy lies. It's not actually in the technology or the tools that are exploding like ChatGPT. It's more in the technology industry and how it's structured. Um, the technology industry is incredibly powerful. It's increasingly monopolistic. A few companies are sort of setting the terms for all of us. We've seen that with Microsoft and OpenAI, Google, Apple, Facebook slash Meta. Um, and it's also largely unregulated. Brussels are attempting to change that with the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, which I think we'll see be like aggressively watered down over the course of this year before implementation comes in. Um, but it's really the equivalent of the pharmaceutical industry with no rules and regulations. The amount of power that all of the all of the software and hardware that these companies are building is huge. It impacts on all of our lives. It's impact, it impacts on our attention spans, on like what we think is important, on our self esteem, on our mental health and increasingly is controlled by a few companies who are very unregulated and who spend, I think at this point, Apple and Meta are spending more than any other company on lobbying, at least in the United States, where that's fairly transparent. So they're spending more on lobbying than big tobacco, and that's because they don't want to be regulated. So I don't think that generative AI or chat GPT is the problem. I'm sure Laura and others can tell you about some of the scary uses of tools like that. But the real problem is that any tool in the tech industry is increasingly owned by these few large players who don't have our interests at heart. Um, and I think that's a that's like a sinister enough note to end off. <laughs> I guess one thing I did want to say is that um, Mozilla this week have launched our own AI company called Mozilla AI. Um, and it's uh, it's focused on trustworthy AI. It's led by an amazing guy called Moaz, um, who's come from industry and is focusing on building partnerships between developers and academics to think about AI products where you are in control of your data, you do have transparency about how the algorithms are working. So it's not entirely hopeless. Um, but yeah, I think generative AI isn't the problem, but the tech industry increasingly is. Thank you so much, Karis. And I would love to just come back with the, the million dollar question of what do we do about it? <laughs> so you mentioned, um, you know, obviously things being unregulated and the DSA and the DMA and not quite sure about how, where those will end up. Do you see regulation as being kind of the answer or is it more around building, like you said, like alternatives and new ways of building and developing AI products? I think regulation is part of the solution. Um, Partly that's my politics. I think the real challenge we have at the moment is a huge asymmetry between the people doing the regulating and the people building the technology. Um, so, and I don't see us closing that gap anytime soon. Um, so I think regulation is part of the, is part of the solution. I think, in, I think the thing that we need to do is invest more in credible alternatives. I don't think it's realistic. I've been doing tech accountability work for years and years now, um, did work on Uber and workers' rights several years ago, worked around kind of meta and women's rights. And I think the real, I don't think it's realistic to ask most internet users to not use these products. So I think regulation is the way we get big players under control. And then we need more credible and viable alternatives that people can use. Um, and Mozilla is part of that picture. Um, but we're nowhere near the scale that we need to be to be able to address, yeah, the issues of the big players. So I think it's regulation plus. Thank you.
I'd love to open it up um, to any kind of immediate reactions um, before we go to, to Laura. Yes. So you said it's not the technology, it's the tech industry. I would submit that it's actually the data. The data comes from ordinary folks like us. And the ordinary folks taken as a whole are racist, sexist, full of opinions that are not really consistent with the good kind of work you'd like to see us do. It's the data. Well, I guess I, I guess I think we need to be a bit more specific about the data because I think the way that you're building can be biased and data isn't good or bad, right? I think so. Maybe that's about a, a view on human beings. Some human beings, well, all of us are racist and sexist, but data sets like Common Voice, I think, are a really great example of the power of aggregating our data for good. The same with the Brex Reporter. Um, I think the real issue is that we're giving the data away for free and we're not aware of the terms and conditions attached to it. Just on that. Yes. Oh, and so could I could I just also ask people to introduce yourself um, when you ask a question, which I forgot to say earlier. Apologies. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Sabina. Um, I work at an agency for Comfort Stories and I'd love to bring uh, Laura in at this point. Um, and um, so Laura said, works at Democracy Technologies um, and would love to hear more from you on your thoughts on how uh, innovations in uh, these technologies are impacting democratic practices for, for good and or for bad. Um, yes. So what we mean by democracy technologies is actually uh, technology, mostly software that is used in uh, democratic processes. So. We um, in the Innovation Politics Institute, um, that's Democracy Technologies as a program of, uh, we mainly look at uh, voting software, digital platforms for citizens' participation, and digital tools for uh, political parties. Um, but one question that you had in uh, the like, preparation brief for me was whether AI should be used for uh, political advice or decisions. And there I have a strict no. <laughs> um, firstly, because it's not good at it. It's a language model. It's yeah, better at being convincing than at being right. Um, and also that means that depending on how you phrase a political question, it gives you very different political answers to put it about political solutions. And then, but even, even if it would be better and right more often. What does right mean? So it, this is kind of similar to the idea of a perfect technocratic government or a benevolent dictator. It sounds appealing, but it's actually a really bad idea for democracy because democracy is at le least as much about the process as it is about the result. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we talk about democracy technologies. They are always used as part of this process. And that obviously the, the political decision making process and opinion forming processes takes place today a lot of the time online in different forms, both formally and informally on discussion uh, panels, um, on social media and online magazine like uh, things like ours. But yeah, social media is a huge one there. Um, but the, the topic that we look at, so uh, technologies specifically for democracies, was actually a, plays a relatively small role in democracy, unfortunately. And in this area, there are quite some good uh, applications of AI, like yeah, also large language models that are, for instance, used for uh, to assist people to um, formulate their argument in a better way. So you can put in your, like, you can do this with ChatGPT. You can um, tell it your uh, your five, your own five arguments for free childcare and ask ChatGTP to write this up in a more compelling way. This way you didn't, you gave ChatGTP the content and it still helps you to um, participate in a democratic process because maybe you weren't able to write this so well or in this language. 
And so there it can help. And a lot of participation platforms also use it, for instance, to um, cluster citizens' entries by topic, which um, ideally uh, in a participation, in a digital participation process, you have a lot of entries and it's very difficult to keep track of them. So it's obviously useful uh, to be able to um, organize them by topic and to get um, a good picture of what what are people discussing about. This can all be very nice and good if it's done in a transparent way. I think um, there is a most important argument that have already been made. Um, obviously, it, it's still relevant to base the models uh, on the right type of data. It's still important to watch out for biases and all of that. So it's still a lot of work to do it in the right way. But now we're coming to the uh, the point where I, I say that I still think that the negative effect or the potential negative effect of AI or generative AI is a lot bigger because it is a lot easier to cre create masses of content that is full of disinformation and spreading the wildest ideas with generative ideas and it is to make those nice tweaks to the to the democratic process so so the one is just a lot stronger and then of course even even when not intentional there it can still contain uh, misinformation because yeah AI is not not always right there is like these biases are like we have observed them most strongly in AI image generation. It's very obvious if you if you let uh, something like Mid Journey uh, generate images of politicians, they are always white men. If you don't specify it's supposed to be a woman, if you specify it's supposed to be a woman, they are usually portrayed in a very sexist way. So this is this is in, in image generation, but obviously the same biases also exist in, in, in language models. I just had um, ChatGTP write me three stories, three uh, small inspiring stories. One was about a police officer who was bullies, bullied as a child. One was about a nurse and one was about a politician. And I think you can guess which genders these people had, although I was not um, asking for specific genders in my prompt. Um, so even on the most superficial level, it still contains those huge biases. And I think at the moment, it's just so overestimated what it can do and the uh, positive effect that actually, yeah, just this expectation in it can create, create a huge uh, negative effect as well. So yeah, as a consequence, I think that for democracy, it's a lot more important that as many people as possible understand the possible flaws and shortcomings of generative AI than to use those nice supportive AI functionalities that can have a positive effect on democracy, but it's just much weaker than the potential harm done by these negative um, applications. Okay. Thanks so much. I'm really interested, I guess, to pick up on this um, idea of yeah, how it could be weaponized particularly for purposes around disinformation or just even spread misinformation unintentionally. Do you see this as a kind of generative AI and, and the use of, of things like ChatGPT as a real step change in that this is really going to kind of change the disinformation landscape? Or is this kind of more of the, you know, all of the issues we've been talking about for the last few years about disinformation on social media and, and recommender algorithms and all the, all the rest of it? Is, do you see it changing significantly? Yeah, I think the quality of it changes by so much. I think so far, all of us are relatively easily able to tell the difference between a Twitter account that's like a, a bot uh, and, and, and one that's not. But And obviously, they also repeat themselves. They all look, kind of look themselves, uh, look identical. And um, yeah, now it will become so much easier to create very different um, masses of very different accounts that participate in all kinds of discussions and um, yeah, um, spread the bullshit that you wanted to spread. So yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's a massive step in, 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 in the quality that, you, that we can expect. Thank you. I'd love to open it up again for thoughts and questions on democratic innovations. 
Sorry, could you would you be able to please speak up a bit? Sorry. So I've got one, and so my idea is that I work um, in comms for technically I work. Um, my, my question probably would be more on the um, on the sort of the business side of things. So I think It's important if you do any sort of progressive work to be optimistic. I would say I'm pretty pessimistic. I think the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act are both really important pieces of legislation. And um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the cookie banner that pops up that annoys you and so you just um, you know, I'm working with Zillow and know your privacy matters. Um, uh, <laughs> So I think the real risk is the people moving on regulation um, are largely nations that don't have any large tech companies headquartered in them, and that is also not a coincidence. Um, so I think as long as the United States is unable um, and or unwilling to regulate big tech companies, I think you're going to see, I think it's going to be hard um, to significantly change the product. I also think you know we did a lot of work last year uh, around the Kenyan election and uh, platform accountability. Uh, so specifically looking at Twitter and TikTok and how mess and disinformation was spreading ahead of the Kenyan election. Um, and we did a lot of work with platforms around that. Um, you know, no one who works at Twitter or TikTok actually wants uh, you know actually wants there to be real world violence because their platforms aren't um, properly moderated. Um, but the difference in terms of the number of humans thinking about a Kenyan election versus the French election or the United States election pretty heavily correlates with the amount of ad spend there are in those countries. So, yeah, I think we have got a real problem at the moment. I think what is happening in Brussels does matter and will impact the industry. But while the United States um, isn't moving, I mean, I think that limits our ability to, to rein in big tech. Um, one of the big problems we have, which is the DSA, the Digital Services Act, which is going through Brussels at the moment, so won't apply in the UK, but will apply in most European countries. So one of the great things in a Digital Services Act is mandating researcher access to platforms because the first problem we have is just not knowing what's going on. Um, and, you know, I don't work at Meta or Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, like these scandals do, like these scandals do generate scrutiny. And I mean, if I don't work in Facebook's or Meta's PR team, but if I did, I'd be slightly numb to scandals at this point. Like, I mean, so I think that it does matter. You know, a lot of the work we do at Mozilla is trying to shine a light and be a watchdog um, around large platforms. Um, so I don't know, at the start of the year, we put out some research that looked at privacy policies in the Google Play Store, really small, really small but significant thing. The privacy policies that apps like Twitter and TikTok had ticked the box off for the Play Store didn't actually match the privacy policies on the apps that you had downloaded on your phone. So just like in the routine, really small ways, these companies are like flagrantly disregarding laws. So I think the scandals do matter. We do need to keep shining a light. We do need to keep scrutinizing those and companies. And right now there is a pretty big asymmetry. I think the, the real hope is Brussels, and I shouldn't be negative and pessimistic about the DSA and the DMA, but I think the challenge we saw with GDPR is that if implementation isn't right for users, you just end up with like an annoying user experience. So GDPR, which is a really powerful and important piece of legislation, for most people is just like an annoying cookie banner that you're just like, oh, I'll accept. Um, and again, I think that is down to this gap between 
legislators and then the builders and the people building the technology. Laura, I wonder if we could um, come to you as well on the, there was a question around um, the prospects for the future of regulation and whether you think regulation can help tackle some of these issues. Do you see these sorts of regulation, you know, particularly in, in Europe at the minute, as kind of good good ways forward to tackle some of these democratic worries? Um, yes, of course, I think it does make a big difference. Um, I think, I mean, there's also a regulation on AI coming uh, up. I think we, we, we still know less about that than um, about the Digital Services Act and about the impact that will have, because there's a lot, has a lot to do in how um, different AI software is categorized in, um, in or models are categorized in terms of their risk, um, which, um, like, obviously some uh, around democracy it's very difficult to really pinpoint the risk that something actually has so like something that we might consider small biases can like in the end be very harmful uh, for democracy even in a context which you wouldn't intuitively characterize as super risky um so there i'm not one very sure if the effect of regulation uh, will be very strong but i think it will definitely impact the way, or we should hope that it impacts the way those, um, especially, um, um, yeah, those um, producers of the big um, AI models uh, do their work and uh, mandate uh, a way higher de a degree of uh, transparency, et cetera, and auditability. So there is definitely the hope that it has a big impact but I wonder about the speed. It's all going very fast right now, so I don't know if the regulation keeps up with that. Yeah, it definitely seems like in the last, few, well, the regulation still thinks very much about how do we regulate Twitter, and <laughs> recently the conversation has moved on rather. Um, were there other questions? Uh, we, okay, we have three. Uh, yes, and then, yes. So, Could I ask for an introduction this time? <laughs> I I agree that I I hundred percent agree with you that technology is a tool and it's how it's used. Specifically, what we were looking at in Kenya was how mis and disinformation and hate speech were spreading through platforms like TikTok, which I mean, TikTok in particular is fascinating. Like the way that, like the way the algorithm works, how quickly it like floods through things. And content moderation is in the power of platforms. It's not about like, and especially platforms where extreme content or content that provokes a strong reaction is more likely to go viral like that is in the control of the platform the problem is the incentives are completely like the incentives are going completely the wrong way um so I mean, we see that on youtube right sensational extreme content is what gets people watching tiktok works a little bit differently but like the concept is still the same so and then the real issue in a country like kenya is just um i'm trying to think how what i can share this um appropriate but you know, the first conversation that I had with one of the major platforms, there wasn't a single Kenyan on the Zoom call. Um, that did change, um, and it changed because we put a lot of pressure on them publicly. But like, if there's if there's no one in Kenya thinking about the Kenyan election working for that platform, then like, of course, there's not going to be anyone tackling this with this information. I mean, one thing we should say about um, the current wave of generative AI is it's mostly in English. Like, I don't think most of these products are available in like Portuguese, Spanish, French, or Kiswahili. I mean, maybe you know more than me because you've been working on it since the 80s. But I think, like, yes, the issue with bad actors, just like the issue is real world violence in the Rift Valley, and these platforms like amp up some of the like worst things that we need to be concerned about um, and let them spread like much quicker. Laura, is there anything you wanted to add on how much is the tech and how much is it the people? Well, it's obviously, it is the people, but if it's so easy for the people to use the tech in that way, and if we have so little means to stop them from doing that, that's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm not afraid of any machine taking over at this point. <laughs> but that, 
but that's not the only risk out there. So yeah, it, it's it's always the people using the tech, but yeah, we cannot rely on them not doing that. I think there have been reports out today saying that um, GPT-4 could be considered early signs of uh, automated general intelligence. So maybe maybe the machines are going to be taking over sooner than we think. Um, there's a question here. And hi, I'm, I'm over here. Um, on the topic of transparency, how do you incentivize companies to open source more material, assuming that's a good thing? Because it strikes me that you have a lot of sort of like WordPress and automatic are quite fond of, who are sort of trying to push by open source, but that hasn't really spread as widely into the sort of big tech of the picture. Yeah, I think it's really hard. Um, and again, I guess regulation is one of the, like, probably the best lever that we have. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's most frustrating is that these companies all are happy to, like, participate in open source projects and like harvest huge amounts of data from people who do open source things but yeah they themselves keep everything fine i think so i i think it is incentives and regulation um and uh i don't think there is like a magic silver bullet break them all up um like uh solution um but i think also there are beyond just crusader companies i think and this is, you know, I think for me, the reason that I still enjoy working in the technology industry, like companies like Mozilla helped to build the internet and the internet was built on community and on sharing. So like, I think those incentives are there and that internet still exists, but like we have to fight for it and we need politicians to be tougher on companies. And I think mandating transparency, which I don't think I finished that point, the Digital Services Act does mandate some transparency and does say researchers need to have access and need to have safe harbor so you can't prosecute them for um looking at your platform so i think those levers will help um but yeah i guess some of the problems are just problems with capitalism which is a personal <laughs> opinion and not Mozilla's opinion um <laughs> yeah there's not money in open source um yeah but you know meta for example uh very fast to download voice data sets um so yeah i think that that asymmetry is particularly frustrating and on the on the topic of transparency i'm interested actually um what what you to hear what you both think about if there are risks to transparency because this is something we see a lot in discussions around the sort of recent you know chat gpt and gpt4 and everything as well but if we make it too open then it'll be copied it'll be used for bad things it'll be a security threat it'll be all of these things well, what, what, the meta thing that they what do you think right, about because it was too easy to produce fake academic papers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, didn't find um, I don't know. I don't, like. I think that the way to try to build regulation that is future proof is to center the harms and like center rights rather than the technology because we can't preempt what's going to come next, and so that's a bad approach. Um, I think that a lot of the anti-transparency chat is crap. Um, I think that we're not in a hypothetical world where this technology, like where technology, or it's, oh, the future, when the internet, like the online and offline worlds aren't a binary anymore. And, you know, depending on how old you are and if you remember dial up internet or no smartphones, like, and then you see a three-year-old who can intuitively use a smartphone, like, you know, that world is here and it's impacting on us. You know, a platform like Instagram, we know has really hugely negative effects on the mental health of like young women and loads of other groups. So for me, I think thinking about big technology companies like pharmaceutical companies is the right approach. And then in that case, we need huge amounts of transparency, not necessarily open access for everyone, but people do need to know what these products are doing and how they work. Um, we wouldn't put a new drug into the market without any safety checks and like a lot of this technology is kind of similar to that. Laura, did you have any any thoughts on risks or limitations of transparency? Well, I only know what is always like the defense, of course, um, and the, 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 the dangers that, that, that there are, that, that there potentially are, but often they're like, oh, it could get you in the wrong hands and they do that and this and that with it. 
And I wonder, like, as a question, not as that I know it, but I wonder if that's not already happening anyway. So the the, the most dangerous people who could get it, like, let's say, like, Chinese espionage, uh, uh, tech espionage, will eventually get those models anyways. So I don't know what the, 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 the trade-off here is. I, I'm not sure that the risks are, like, mitigate like the risk of transparency are really gone when you're not transparent so um but of course regarding like there it comes also back to this data topic like many of these models have been trained on like all kinds of uh data from the internet and there is personal data in there so like if, you, if all these huge uh, data sets were published um yeah not sure if, if, if that is that would be co the correct way to go either, but then they shouldn't have been used from the beginning. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I think we had some questions from the internet. Yes, um, <laughs> we have some questions from online participants, so I'm just going to put those together. So um, Andreas uh, was kind of wondering what they what the panelists make of the open AI approach uh, to transparency. Um, uh, and yeah, I think we've kind of covered some of those costs and benefits. Um, also uh, talking about kind of how should we think about the potential weaponization of AI in militaries? Um, is there any kind of domain where that's going to be utilized in that way? Um, also, uh, Damien had something to say about um, uh, the beneficial uses of AI. So kind of saying, you know, these tools could be used by NGOs that work for democracy, civil technologies. Um, so there's it's bringing some kind of potential positive perspective as well. Um, and from his experience in Poland, he's seen uh, some really great stuff happening in the non-governmental sector in Poland using this kind of technology. Um, and George, uh, finally, um, is saying that he doesn't see any possibility of slowing down bad actors here. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, a lie gets halfway around the world before truth puts on its boots. Um, so we might have good intentions, but how do we catch up to the harms? Thank you. So we've had a couple more questions on um, transparency and open AI's approach in particular. Uh, any implications for any military implications of AI we should be worried about? Uh, beneficial uses of AI uh, that could be used by civic tech, NGOs, etc. And are we being too optimistic to think that we can tackle this information? Laura, can I come to you first for any initial reflections on those? Well, of course, I mean, I've, I've mentioned already some of the positive um, applications in, in, in civic techs, like tech, it can really help people like to participate in, 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 in democracy by helping them formulate arguments, by making use of open data. Um, I don't know if that would always be um, generative AI, though. Um, um, I, 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 I think it it should be used in those positive ways. I mean, there's, it's not making it any better. Like it's not like um, a remedy for the negative effects if it's not also used for the positive effects. So uh, of course it should be used. And I think actually there is one uh, one way that this has a positive, uh, an additional positive effect than in, in those tools themselves is like by everybody trying out all types of, um, AI tools, maybe people uh, learn more about the weaknesses and understand the weaknesses. So I'm also all for using AI more in schools and in um, uh, education settings in general, like really trying it out, for trying out the different versions. Um, because I think education is one of the, like next to regulation, one of the biggest, um, well, biggest tools that we have against the negative uh, effects. I actually don't know enough about the uh, transparency approach of, of open AI, other than that it has been criticized for like being less and less um, to actually say one, much more about that. Thank you. And Karis, I guess on the, uh, be interesting to hear a bit more about Mozilla, Mozilla AI and what your kind of hopes yeah. for, hopes um, for responsible AI. Yeah, I think future I, could my be. area of expertise is not the military. Um, my understanding is that AI is already quite widely used in a lot of different uh, military contexts. And that's probably like the AI we probably need to worry about the most isn't the stuff that's consumer facing. It's probably the back end scary stuff. Um, so yeah, Mozilla AI is 
brand new, so we haven't got a lot of products to talk about, but I guess the one that Moes would encourage me to talk about if you were here, um, uh, is looking at recommender systems and using AI to sort of train a recommender system to what you want. So actually um, flipping the paradigm and saying, instead of having to deal with YouTube's algorithm, which is feeding you like what it thinks will make you really angry or um, scared, could you train an AI to serve you content that you wanted? Um, so I think there is a huge potential. Um, I think there is a huge, I think with any technology and especially um, any era of the internet, there's huge potential to do good. I'd really agree with Laura that alongside regulation, it's education. I think I, I think I'm more optimistic on that side because as someone who's been working with um, trustworthy artificial intelligence, which does not roll over the over the top of the tongue uh, for the last couple of years, I think on the one hand, um, a couple of years ago when we sort of ran focus groups talking about AI, everyone was just talking about the Terminator, um, which <laughs> I have still not seen because I'm very scared of those sorts of films. Um, <laughs> And like in lots of small ways, like one of the things in our YouTube study did, people are aware of algorithms and like trying to sort of game them and play with them. So I think we do get a bit more savvy as the technology evolves, so do we. And so I think I am optimistic that just as right now we can spot a bot, I think we will start to learn the tells of generative AI. Um, so I, and I think that, you know, the power of, um, especially some of the speech to text and text to speech tools that are powered by large language models could really be transformative um, if you couldn't read and write but you had a smartphone that could like capture what you were saying and write it down um, if you are like if you are visually impaired or hard of hearing like there are really powerful and great applications of those technologies that really are transformative. So I think I still carry like some techno optimism um, alongside a heavy dose of sort of pessimism and yeah, and just an assessment of like the power and the money and the industry and how it's being shaped. I don't know if I answered all of those. Uh, yes, okay. yes, thank you. Um, more questions, yes, uh, over here and then over there. and they're all about ending autonomous farm systems but their campaign is about digital dehumanization the idea that an ai can enact harm on humans and obviously it's going to deny that exists on such a grand scale um and the most lethal consequence of that is the autonomous weapon system the weapon system that can act without any kind of human intervention and utilizes all these tools which have inside biases in it and facial recognition technology um which you know is hypothetical situations where you could say you know, attack a certain demographic in this location and this area and the drone and then they're not to go do that work. Um, just anyone who's any interest in the military applications of AI is strongly suggested to check out their work. They've got a really great research lab um, looking at digital humanization. They're an amazing campaign. Um, and yeah, that's Thanks so much. Um, I think we had a question over there. I just want to check, Laura, can you hear us all right? We've had a little microphone issue. Uh, I can hear you. Um, comments from the audience not that well. Okay, we will we will check in on, on the technology and have a question from the corner while we try and sort that out. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about the country banners is some sites, there's a sort of default allow, which is coloured in to make it really easy to click. And then other sites, um, which I think some good examples, do sort of, that are more privacy forward, do say like, prompt you more to reject them. I think. Sorry, sorry. We're just we're just trying to revive the owl, which has the tendency to stop the working. <laughs> um, just trying to make see if it's alive. Yeah, the name is a little Twin Peaks, kind of the owl's not with us. 
Um, Can you see on the so the thing I, so I think the thing that uh, we we've been working on that I think is most exciting on that front is less about website interfaces but more about viewing your data as a commodity. So we've got something called the Data Teachers Lab that um, funds projects that are trying to reimagine uses of data. So um, one of the projects is with a group of Uber drivers. So giving that so Uber harvests so much data from like us as passengers and drivers and sort of hoards it and uses it to. Um, make money and transport us and give us food. Um, so one of the projects we're doing with uh, both James Farrar is looking at, well, what if you let Uber drivers have, a, you know, just like they can form a union, form a data collective. So I think probably the solutions are ways for us to reimagine our data and understand like, this is an asset that I have. Um, and so could we, yeah, start to pool our data and then what would that then mean? Because if, if you aggregated the data, then suddenly it's a valuable asset for platforms rather than all of us giving it away for free. I think we're a long way away from that being at scale, but I think that's the stuff that could be like really transformative for, for all of us and how we use the internet. Thank you. I think we're all back connected now. The owl is working. <laughs> um, is working. It's, it's got its little lives. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to, we've just got a few minutes left, um, so I wanted to put a question to, to both of you to wrap up, um, which is we've talked a little bit about education, um, we've talked about kind of democratic uses of technologies, we've talked about data literacy and understanding where your data goes. Um, at Demos we were thinking about how can we be bringing the public and the voice of the public into policy making more. Um, so I'm interested in how you think the public's voice could be heard more in discussions around generative AI. What do policymakers need to be doing differently? Um, how could we be making a more kind of bringing up more participatory approach to thinking about AI? Um, so I'll go to Laura first and then uh, to answer that and any final reflections and then hand over to Karis to wrap up. Um, yes, I think one thing that can be done in this regard is to take transparency uh, to an even higher level to not just um, publish the code, but actually have like, discussions with people about it who cannot read code. Uh, like I think this, like with um, yeah, open source software, there's always the expectation that um, of course we can check what it does, but who can actually check what it does? And um, not everybody that's affected or using um, a software can do that. Um, so I think in, in the process of developing that and in the process of making policy around that, it should be just a lot more uh, people being involved. And I actually like this Uber ex example um, regarding the data. So the people whose data are, is being used for a, anything, um, any AI training data um, should also be involved. So I think it, it, it needs to be a much more collaborative process, although, of course, this is very difficult to organize. But I think really, yeah, it starts in schools or everywhere with people trying these things out and being able to ask the right questions. And actually, even like policymakers should probably try out what they're <laughs> um, making policy about, because I, I don't think that's always happening. Actually, they, they're being advised by experts, which is great, but they also need to check it out themselves much more. So we've got mandatory chat GPT training for, for MPs. I, I love it. <laughs> Karis, I can come to you for um, thoughts. Yeah, okay, good question. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I sort of still as, you know, in a previous incarnation, um, working for BlackBerry, trying to get MPs to understand how to use their BlackBerry smartphones many, many years ago. Like, I think rather than focusing on upskilling politicians, I think taking a harm-centered approach and like an approach that's more about, so what is it that we want technology to do and what are the guardrails um, for me feels important. And then, yeah, I think that like, also a lot of this stuff is fun, right? Like that was my first encounter with it. People sending around like hilarious Christmas songs about their families and things. So I think like staying with that play and enjoyment and the fact that we are getting something out of this technology or we wouldn't be using it. Um, you know, I can hear my father's voice in Ghana now for free. I don't have to go to a shop in Brixton and buy a phone card and like try and dial him. And that's because of WhatsApp and that's why I stay on WhatsApp, um, even though he does send me a lot of fun interesting content um, <laughs> but so i think like keeping that sense of play and remembering that we are voting with our feet and then the role of politicians is to put in the guardrails to think about what are the harms that we need to guard against like i mean 
probably less true of people in this room, but I guess we need to be informed and ethical consumers, as we always do need to be. There are lots of companies, not just Mozilla, um, that focus on protecting your privacy. I mean, Signal is a great example of an alternative to WhatsApp, um, also backed by a nonprofit. Um, and so I think voting with our feet, focusing on education, um, trying to use the alternative products that are out there. Um, and yeah, I still, I am still optimistic that we get savvy along with the tech. Um, and so remembering that as we use and interact these things, we also sort of develop like a bit more of a, a sixth sense about, you know, what's fake news or what's, what's crap. So not to say we don't need to regulate these companies, but not to be totally scared that the robots are going to come and do this. Great, thank you so much. And I, I love the idea of yeah, remembering the joy in technology as well as um, just worrying about all of the all of the harms when the owl develops sentience and takes its revenge. Um, the owl is actually quite scary. <laughs> um, so, as promised, we need to do a final vote to see if anyone has changed their minds. Um, for people who think that generative AI, let's start the other way around. People who think generative AI is not good for democracy, show of hands, please. Okay. People who think it is good for democracy. Okay, we have got more optimistic, except for Sophia, who's got less optimistic over the course of the evening. But uh, going by the numbers, we, we've almost doubled our support for um, democracy via generative AI. So I think that's a very good note uh, to thank our speakers. Um, and please do hang around and have a drink. And, and we'd love to chat to you all now. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining, Laura. We really appreciate it. It was nice to meet you, Laura.